From the French Revolution to Goya's 3rd of May, to the propaganda art of communist China, the relationship of art and politics has been sometimes complementary, sometimes antagonistic. In his controversial Nobel speech, Art, Truth and Politics, delivered via video, the 2005 Nobel laureate in literature, British playwright Harold Pinter, spoke of the need to distinguish between the search for truth in art and the avoidance of truth in politics. There are political art that is really sincere, but confrontational. And, you know, yes, they're all talking about politics. One is using politics to manipulate. One is using pol uh, politics to confront and to try to tell what we believe as truth. Art is a means of communication, it's a medium of expression, but art can also empower. So all these, you know, are related, you know, to politics. Last week's commemoration of the 20th anniversary of the Tiananmen Square crackdown once again led to much discussion of the relationship of art and politics, particularly here in Hong Kong. On the 30th of May, Danish sculptor Jen Galshot, creator of the Pillar of Shame, was, as last year, denied entry to Hong Kong. He and his two sons wanted to be here for the 20th anniversary, for which he'd made two new sculptures. After being questioned at the airport for five hours, Yen was sent away with no explanation. His sons and those sculptures, fragment of a democracy story, got through. It's really sad that Jens did not get through, but, but at least the sculptures got in. And, and he came here to do a lot of work to help the, the Alliance, the students, and to, to, uh, to bring up the memories of the Tiananmen massacre. But his sculptures got in, and we got in and, and came to work as messengers for him, you know. So, so in that way, uh, the symbols and the stories that, that he came here to tell are still being told. There are now five Pillar of Shame sculptures erected around the world to remind people of violations of human rights. The one at the University of Hong Kong was given an orange coat of paint last year to draw renewed attention to the human rights situation in mainland China. At the candlelight vigil on Thursday, the two brothers went on stage to burn the condolence book. Hong Kong is still the only place on Chinese soil in which June the 4th is publicly commemorated. But the sculptor's sons say they're aware of a worrying situation developing. You can also tell the newspapers are allowed to, to write about it and you're allowed to report on it, but, uh, but in, in some way it kind of makes it more scary when you don't know uh, the rules, you don't know uh, what is legal and what, what is illegal. It seems that, that there is a slight pressure from the Chinese uh, side just maybe taking a little bit of freedom of speech, a little bit of democracy every day or, or I mean, by denying some people to enter and allowing some other people to enter and I think that's a frightening development also. Over the past decade another sculpture, this one on the other side of the harbour outside the cultural centre, has also served as a memorial for June the 4th. Reflecting a wariness of Hong Kong authorities, there's a story, likely apocryphal, that its creator, French artist César Baldaccini, originally called it Freedom Warrior, but that when the Cartier Foundation donated it to the then Urban Council in 1992, the council changed its name to the Flying Frenchman. Baldaccini did create another sculpture called Man of Freedom that same year. But whatever the truth, many local viewers today see its single wing as a symbol of hopes for freedom dashed, the gun-like objects on its front as symbols of repression. On Wednesday, a group of artists, musicians and poets gathered at the work for poetry reading and music to remember June the 4th. One was Hong Kong poet and writer Lang Ping Kwan, also known as Ya Si, who's written several poems on the theme of the crackdown in Tiananmen Square. Some 
at that time I was looking at the the, the tent in the Tiananmen Square as a square that has lasted for many years and seemed to have not changed. But now people are trying to change it. So so I wrote a poem called um, the Square about the square. A little bit later, that people begin to say there's nothing happened and nobody died and so on. So I wrote another poem about. Uh, cleaning up the home. And so actually, I use the images of home and furniture and like moving home or, or what happened in the home or cleaning up the home and pretending there's nothing happening. Where have they all gone now? Turn into the constant shadows by our side. Turn into the sun and air of our days. Turn into the plants and furniture in our lives. Turn into the book, we read over and over again. 